for a few minutes. And then I'm going to take some examples and work through the examples. Look at the way we used to do things and the way we can do moving forward. Uh, uh, if you have any questions or comments, best time to ask them is when you have it. So please don't wait till the end. And if you do have a question, and if you only raise your hand, you will think that I'm ignoring you, but I'm not. I just cannot see you. So you know, just vocalize, ask a question, draw my attention, and I'll be glad to listen to you. So let's get started. Well, the first question, we've been programming in imperative style for a very long time. Uh, I would say most of the industry uh, as a mainstream has been programming in imperative style. And if you let us sit down and think about problems, we probably think about imperative style in imperative style a lot more because it's very natural to us that's what we're being used to. But it really helps us to change our minds and start thinking in functional style. The very first thing about functional style is it is declarative. Not everything that is declarative is functional, but what is functional is often declarative. So the idea behind this is you, you communicate much more clearly what your intention is rather than getting drawn into low-level details. We'll look at some examples of that along the way. We use higher order functions. We are, we are used to passing uh, objects to functions. We can also pass functions to functions. We are used to creating objects within functions. We can also create functions within functions. We're also used to returning objects from functions. We can now return functions from functions. So in other words, we can pass functions, create functions, return functions, much like how we do with objects. And we can be on our immutability, and we create pure functions. So the idea behind this is we don't mutate stuff. We instead engage in state transformation rather than state mutations. But why should we really do this? The very first uh, good reason would be the code is concise. So what does mean the code is concise? Well, we will end up writing code that is going to be very much expressive and up to the point if you want to think about it that way, right? We don't have to write a whole lot of code to get our So conciseness, and I also have a less code down below, but what's the difference? Well, I'm going to distinguish between two terms here. One is concise, and the other is terse. Both concise and terse often means less code. But concise code is less code, which is transparent. Terse code is less code, which is opaque. Concise code is less code, which you can understand. Terse code is less code, which is waiting to hurt you when you least expect. So that's a way for you to think about terseness versus conciseness. They both end up having less code. The code is more expressive, so you can easily figure out what the code is doing, easy to communicate, easy to maintain as well. And of course, it's less code. What's a, what's a better than less code? Well, the code you didn't write has the fewest bugs, right? Absolutely, I would rather have less code than more code. It's easy to understand once we get comfortable with the syntax. It's easier to modify the code. We end up usually with fewer bugs because of the explosiveness and uh, also reduced mutability. We can also easily make code parallel. But it's a paradigm shift. Now, it's usually easy to pick a syntax. It's usually easy to learn a new library. But it's pretty difficult to change our thinking. And usually, Paradigm shifts are much more difficult. But normally what happened in the past is when you switched languages, you probably switched paradigms. But with both C Sharp and Java, they have evolved these two languages. But without switching the language, we are required to switch the paradigm, which is really the challenge because we have to really put a conscious effort to really program in a better way while the old way of programming is still there and maybe even applicable in some parts of the system than others. So that's what makes it a little bit more challenging. I want to take some problems and work through it here. The first problem I want to take here is going to be a rather a very simple iteration that I want to work with. So let's start with this little example. Is the font size OK for in the last row? Thumbs up if it's OK. Thumbs down if it's not. That's thumbs up. OK, all right, thanks. So here is our list. And I have gone through the list of elements. 
For i equal to 0, i less than count, i plus plus, and then I'm printing the value out, right? So everybody has written code like this. But if you look at this code, there is, so people will look at this code and say, oh, that's a simple for loop, right? I'm sure you've heard that, right? But I got this word mixed up. The word here is not the word simple. The word here is familiar. The big difference between the word familiar and the word simple. Familiar is something you've looked at so many times, you don't care to look at it again. Simple is not necessarily familiar, right? This is very familiar. But it's not simple. Why is it not simple? Well, first, it's got way too many moving parts in it. You first have to initialize i properly. Then you set the boundary condition properly. Then you have to increment it. Have you ever had a chance to put less than or equal to a of less than? Did you have ever have to do that? Absolutely. And the day you don't think about it is the day you have the off by one error. How annoying that is when that happens, right? So that code is actually fairly complex though it is very familiar. But we can already do better than this in, in, in C Sharp, right? So rather than doing it this way, we can eliminate this much noise in code by saying for each var e and then in numbers, and then we could simply use the e here to print it. Now why would we want to do more work compared to this one? The only time you would want to use the index operation is when you want to go change a particular value at the index, which in itself is a poor choice anyways, so most of the time this is a better solution. However, this is still called as an external iterator. Now what is an external iterator? External iterator is like having a rude dog. You probably had some of these dogs at home, right? You go to the app and say, move, and it doesn't budge. You have to push it with your leg for a few feet, right? It's like you have to control the whole thing yourself. You suddenly leave everything else you do, and now you're managing the iteration. Whereas in internal iteration, it's kind of like throwing the frisbee and the dog goes to get it. So you have to put this on some more of an autopilot if you want to, rather than working through it. So rather than going through that much amount of effort, what you can instead say is, well, I want to start with this uh, value, the numbers that's been given to me. But what I'm going to do here is simply say numbers dot for each. And I'm going to say, given a value, I want to go ahead and print that particular value. So this is called a, an internal iterator. So internal iterator. So what does an internal iterator actually do? Typically, this will be on the same line because I'm using a huge font size. I cannot fit that in here. But you can see how you're saying for each of the value in the collection, do that work for me. So rather than sitting here and managing the iteration, you are simply saying, here's my focus. This is what I want to do for each of the elements. Well, you take care of doing the iteration. I don't want to focus on it. So one of the very first things we can do as we start working with the code. So I, I work in multiple different languages. And from time to time, I work with programmers uh, using JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, F Sharp, what have you. But one thing I've noticed quite a bit is when I sit down and work with a number of C-sharp programmers, they tend to code the traditional way even though C-sharp has had functional style for a while. For a couple of reasons for that. One reason is they're most comfortable with it. That's what they've done for a long time. So naturally they think about it that way. Second, there's a lot of legacy code. And when you have a lot of legacy code, when most of the code looks that way, it's only natural to write any other code in the same way, but we have to put a little extra effort to deviate from that. So what I would encourage is, as you're starting to write code, every time you are writing new code, I'm not really interested in changing existing code. I don't think that's really a great idea. If you have no reason, don't change it for the sake of changing it. So writing new code, Rather than writing an external iterator, think about, hey, can I use an internal iterator instead of it? Well, an internal iterator itself, you 
Talk less code. It's, it's less verbose. It's more concise. It is more expressive once we get used to it. And then once we get into the habit of writing it that way, it's really hard for us to go back and program the other way. But until we make a very clear effort to break off from that habit, it's very difficult to start writing in a very different way, especially when we have really used it the other way for a long time. Especially if we have this habit of doing something else that programmers often do, which is copy and paste code, right? And if they all code that way, the code is magically not going to be in a different way, so again, we have to put a little bit more effort in, in changing that. So that gives us an idea about how we could go through iterations, and we can use internal iterators for that. So we saw the old imperative way of writing that, and we saw the external iteration, and you can use the internal iteration. Likewise about filtering values. So if you have a collection of values and you want to be able to filter out only certain values from it. So let's again take our old code here, run this code first of all. You can see the code is still running, but what is this code doing? Well, it's got values 1 through 10, but it's performing a filter operation. So there's a filter, and what it's doing is it says for each variable e in numbers, and E is even, add it to the collection, and then go back and print it. So this is an operation that I seem to perform quite extensively. For example, when I develop a web application, I might have an application where I'm dealing with backload insurance. And oftentimes, the use case, I'm, use the story I'm working with says, well, you want to list only insurance that are coming up for removal in the next 30 days. Well, how do I do that? Well, I've got to go to this big load of insurances, and I want to start filtering out only insurance that are up for removal in the next 30 days. So that's a filter operation, isn't it? I could keep writing code loop after loop. Well, typically this would be in a database, but if it is already in memory for whatever practical purpose, what would you normally do? And even otherwise, normally I would have performed other queries, and I got a boatload of data now in memory, but with that data, I want to apply certain other logical transformations or filtering. So filtering is something I do extremely, uh, quite often when it comes to web development, for example. And so if I'm going to do this imperatively, that is a lot of code to sit there and write. And one of the things you learn as you progress through, when you're a very young developer, fresh out of school, and you come as an aspiring developer, one thing you tell yourself is, I'm going to go find a job and write a lot of code. Once you get experienced, you come to work and say, I'm going to work hard so I don't have to write any code today. Right? That is called experience. Because you realize the more code you write, somebody else has to keep developing it, right? And the more code you write, the more somebody curses you too, right? That happens too, right? Uh, does anybody look at your code and praise you? Very rarely that happens, right? It's usually a bunch of codes that kind of piles upon you. Well, you become a little smarter over time. I mean, I love writing code, but, but equally so, I'll try my best to say, that's a code have to write. Well, at least one way we can do that is to say, I don't have to write at least that much of code. So filtering is an operation we do quite often. So this could be filtering on a number, it could be filtering on an object, certain properties, whatever that could be. So in this case, of course, how do we really write this in a way it doesn't take that much effort, it's much more concise and easier to understand, easier to follow as well, assuming we know how to read it. So we could say, for example, given these numbers, we could say where, and we could say given an element, element mark 2 is equal to 0, and then we could say, well, that's basically the data that I'm getting. And I could put this to a list, for example, in this case, and I could start even iterating it. So for each, and I could say given an element, well, why don't you go ahead and output the element, and you can say that's what I want to display in this particular case, and you can start displaying the values for it. So you can start working through, and you can see already there is a lot less code than we had a few minutes ago, and definitely if there's a way for you to write less code, you would rather write less code than write more code. 
So you can see how the code becomes a lot more expressive by just going through that route. But of course, if you look at the top code, you have to do more parsing, right? Your human eye has to go through and examine the code a lot more. And when you do this for 10 hours a day, it becomes really tiring over time, right? On the other hand, when you look at the code on the bottom, well, that's more expressive. That's a lot less code to be looking at already. And it's also a single pass. You can say, given all these numbers, get me the values where this rule or the predicate applies. And then, of course, I just want to put those values or do other things in the chain. So it becomes a lot more expressive and elegant to write the code along the way. Well, typically in C sharp, you probably are used to doing it this, right? where everything is in one line like that, the bots kind of keep flowing, well, you can do that too. But I find it a lot more easier to make it this way, so easily I can scan through and say, operation one, operation two, operation three, I'm done, so a single pass. So anything you can do to make it easier on your eyes, right? And if you're able to quickly grasp what's going on, absolutely, you're winning the code at the time. So that is an example, but imperative versus functional style. What's the difference? Well, notice in this code, we not only focused on how to actually do the loop and how to perform the computation, we also did something else. We constantly mutated this particular collection by calling add over and over and over. If you turn up the volume and run this code, you would literally hear the variable filter say, uh, filter say ouch, ouch, ouch on this line because I'm poking at it several times, right? Well, look at this code. There was no external mutation. This code is very humane. No variable was tortured in the making of the result here, right? So it's a lot more humane way of writing than that particular code, so it wins. So let's quickly compare the contrast these two. We are so used to imperative style of coding, but we can lean more towards a declarative style of coding. And declarative style of coding is very expressive, but it does take a bit of getting used to. And the reason it takes a bit of getting used to is because we have done it the other way so many times. So in a way, if you look at the imperative versus declarative, the imperative code, you pretty much provide a very step-by-step -step detail on what you're trying to really do. The declarative code, on the other hand, Simply you say what you want to do and let the underlying code take care of the details for you. You don't have to sit there and specify every single detail. So you focus on how in an imperative, whereas you can focus on what in the declarative. You normally mutate variables in imperative. You don't normally mutate in the declarative. You shouldn't have side effects when you have imperative code. You try to go towards a pure function in the declarative styles. You accept usually data, but here you can also pass functions. That's more of a functional style which uh, encompasses declarative. It's very hard to compose, whereas it's very easy to compose. Entertain this thought for a minute. When you're writing code, when you're designing your own APIs, we have this tendency to create two kinds of functions or methods. Those that return values and those that often a void. Now think of these two words, statements and expressions. If you look at C sharp for a minute, in C sharp, what would you normally say this one is, right? If you're writing a C sharp code, and let's say for a minute I have a variable, we'll call it as age, so I say int age over here, and I'm going to say if, so we'll get a value for this, whatever the value is, and I'm going to say if, so that could be coming in from another function, and I could say if age is greater than 17, and I'm going to do some work, else I'm going to do some work. Well, what is, what is if? What do you say? Well, complete the word. This is a if what? If it's an if statement, right? Why do you say it's an if statement? Well, the reason is this. Can I do this? I can say, you know, for example, please vote. I'm going to say please vote. And can I replace this with uh, something like uh, go home kid, right? So I'm going to replace these two. And then I'm going to say here something like string can I vote equals. Will that code work? 
What do you think? No. no? Error. Invalid expression. Well, yeah, you got a statement when an expression is needed. Well, think of this for a minute. Why should a language have a statement? Why? What if we start having a language with no statements at all? What if we have a language where everything becomes an expression? Then what will happen? What do you call an expression? Well, what's the difference between a statement and an expression? An expression says, I'll do some work, and when I'm done, I'll give you a result. Right? That's what an expression An expression is very kind. It does work and gives you a result. What does a statement do? A statement, you call a statement, a statement, can you do some work for me? It says, yep, I'm done. Oh, thanks, statement. What did you do? I won't tell you. I left that memory and you'll go get it to yourself, right? How rude. That's what a statement does, right? Statements by default cause mutations. If a statement never causes mutation, if a statement never has a side effect, it cannot survive. A statement that doesn't have a side effect doesn't exist. It's a no-op, right? So statements by definition have to cause mutations, cause side effects. In a purely functional language, there are no statements. There are only expressions. And even those that eventually cause a side effect, do you have a guilt they return some values? If nothing else, they return a null, for example, or a unit, as they call it. So essentially, the language is kind of be, can be baked into. But take this to the heart and say, when we design our own APIs, why not design them with expressions rather than statements? Then what would happen? Well, then people using our APIs can call, get results, and perform more operations on it, and start composing things rather than saying, do this work, go get something from the state, do this work, go get... So it breaks the flow, right? Expressions don't break the, break the flow, it becomes more natural. And so, you take data in imperative versus we try to transform data in the functional style. So let's look at one example here. I want to create a function, and I want to use a functional composition aspect of things. So errors often lurk around in imperative code. We often don't even see the problems that may be lingering around for a, for a long time. And that becomes really hard for us to maintain code when we cannot quickly find problems and we can fix it. Functional style can help us to remove this, and it's important to kind of get this concept of functional style into our minds quite a bit. And that becomes a lot more easier to work with in the long run. So think about this for a minute. Suppose I have this collection, I showed this in the previous session, but worth going through. So I have this collection, and I want to go through this collection and say, find the first even number of greater than 3. We can uh, 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 double off, let's just find the double off the first even number greater than 3. We get into this mess quite often when we go through imperative code. Because imperative code, by nature, lets us go through various detail, and it wears us out when we are trying to go through all these details, rather than being explicit and say, that's the result I want to get, right? So in this particular example, what we can do is we can say, well, I could start with the result. But this is fundamentally broken already, right? Well, what if there is no result? What if there is no result to produce? What do you end up getting? You end up getting zero. But shouldn't this be nullable rather than zero, right? So that's a question we should really ask, but we do so many low level details. Likewise, if I were to ask you to loop through a collection of values, and if I ask you to find, let's say, uh, prime numbers in a collection, and I tell you to go find all these prime numbers in this collection, and I ask you to cherry pick a certain values. In an imperative style, we get really hung up on the details quite often. Let's look at a couple of different examples here. Let's say, since I showed you that example, I'll give you another example here, uh, in this case. Let's say I have a, a collection of numbers starting with one up to a max. I don't know what the max is, up to a max. So what I want to do, find the total of the, let's say, uh, prime numbers. So I want to find the total of all the prime numbers in that condition that's given. 
So how would you normally uh, go through and produce this? Well, we are used to writing code like this, right? So we would say static boolean, and then what could we say? E is prime. That's one of the first functions we need. So we can start with a number. And then what would we do to get the value here? Well, the first of all, the number should be greater than 1. If the number is not greater than 1, it's not prime. Great. But what if the number is E is greater than 1? What do we do? Well, we would say for, we'd start with the for loop. And then we would say int, for example, a value. So var i is equal to, maybe we'll start with a 2. And we'd say i less than maybe the given number. And then we could say i++, plus plus, not getting very fancy, a very simple loop through. We could say if number mod i is equal to 0, well, then you can simply say return uh, false. Well, let's see if that's actually uh, correct, if that's going to even work. So we could say, for example, in this case, uh, you know, output, and we could say e is prime, try a few values. One, obviously, in this case, shouldn't work at, uh, at all. So we could call the e is prime number a boo. So uh, e is prime shouldn't give us any result for that. It's a false, great. Well, we know two is a prime. We could try a few more numbers, three. And we know four shouldn't be a prime. And we could check for five, for example. So it kind of keeps telling that that seems to be OK. We could write more tests on it. But look at this code for a second. That's an example of an imperative code. Well, in this particular example, we don't have mutability. Would you agree? We are tempted to say yes. What about the variable i? Is that being mutated or not being mutated? That's probably being mutated here, right? In for each versus for, there's a difference between the two, right? So, so mutability kind of ensues along the way again. Can we do this differently? Is there a way to make this more expressive? Let's try. What if we say enumeration dot range? Is there enumeration or enumerator? Anybody? Enumerator? Range of 1, 2, well, 2, 2. What are the values that enumerator takes? Same value and what? Account. So I want a count of number minus 2. And what do I want to say here? I could say any, given the value, number mod i is equal to 0. Is this true for any value in the range? Well, if it is true for any value in the range, I could put an exclamation. It's not true for any value in the range. And we could try that. And we can say number greater than 1 and we could say do that. So then we can get rid of that code, assuming that actually works. So let's try this out. So I'm going to say e is prime for a 2. And uh, I don't think I need to check for 1. Just a couple of values, right? So 2, 3, 4, and 5. So did I write it correctly? We'll find out. So enumerator, come on, help me out. What is this called? Enumeration? So enumeration. So try again. What is it? Enumerable. So third time is a charm. So enumerable, number is greater than 1 and enumerable range 2 to number minus 2. Did I say? Mistype it. So there we go, right? So enumerable gave the trick, isn't it? Well, that gives us a prime. So what did we do? We said we don't have to start looping yet another time. So we need to rewire our minds and say, why are we going to think about this expressively? Rather than saying, take the left turn, take the right turn, take the right turn, take the left turn, where are we going? Think of the bigger picture and try to express that. Given this range of value, is there any that's divisible? Hey, that reads like English. Now let's put that in code, right? And we, the only way we will be able to change our way of writing code like this is by changing our way of writing code like this. It doesn't happen by thinking about it alone, right? And the first few times, it's going to be very difficult because it's different from the way we do it. But the third time, you're like, heck, I don't want to do it the other way around, right? It becomes very natural. But let's try something else here. Let's say 
I want to give a max value, right? So I want to find these values. So what should I do? Int total equal to 0, output total. Now for int 1, so uh, for variable i equal to 1, and uh, i less than uh, equal to max, i plus plus, and what are we going to do here? I'm going to say, find the total of the prime numbers, right? So if e is prime of i, total plus plus. And then we can uh, get these, right? Find the total of the prime numbers, not the number of prime numbers, sorry. Total plus equal to i. So what is max? Well, let's define max. So let's say int ma uh, max is equal to maybe that value. So run it, that gave us a value. Once again, look at the code. That is imperative code. We all have written code like this. But we don't have to. What can we do to write differently? Shall we try? So enumerable dot range from what? One to max. Now we've got a range of values on our hand. What should I do now? Suggestions. A where, right? Where is prime? Then what? Some operation. Because you want to total those values, right? So, so total the values and find the sum of it. So question for you, how many of you here write code like this regularly? Most of us, right? That's what we do, absolutely. How many of us write code like this regularly? Very few hands go up, right? Very few. No, we are using some tools, right? Tools are suggesting that, right? Sir? So which, so which one? Top or the bottom? Okay, and then what do you do with the tools? Yes, complete your sentence. You have more to say or you're done? No, you can use the tools like three sharp or they are using it, right? Go on, keep going. I, that's a phrase. I haven't, I haven't heard a conclusion to it. What are you saying? No, we are using... Uh, oh, we are using your saying. That, that gives more uh, uh, values, references, all these things it suggests, as well as it, it, it looks more clear, the code looks more clear. Right, but, but at some point we got to quit writing the old code and asking the tool to change it. Right? we got to make the transition in our mind, right? So, otherwise, we're going to be writing that code and saying, hey tool, can you do it? Rather than using resharp, we become sharper, right? So we can resharp our minds. Then we are able to solve bigger algorithms and problems with it. Never may be able to make the transition into solving a bigger problem, right? So that is something important. Yes, please. Dominic, if you would, I would not be able to hear you. What is the problem? So the question is, the second one, debugging is a problem. I don't know because I don't put bugs in the car. Um, we assume that debugging is a problem. Let's see. Why is debugging is a problem? Shall we think about it? Why is debugging a problem? Because there's lambdas. That's not true. Because lambdas are just another construct in the language. If you step into a function, what does it do? It steps into a function. A lambda is a glue code. You step into E prime, can you take a while? Guess where it's going to step into? E is prime. So the problem with debugging is not because of lambdas, right? These are called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We all do this. The minute we see something different, we want to come up with every reason to reject it. The problem here is not lambdas. The reason why this is debugging is hard, is a, it's, it's true, debugging is hard, but not because of lambdas. You've got to ask the questions, why? Debugging C sharp code is hard. Can you say yes or no? No. Wait a minute. I forgot to mention I'm using multiple threads in the code. You're laughing, right? Well, that's exactly the point. Debugging code with lambda is not a problem. 
but Lambda often may engage in a lazy evaluation. It potentially may be in a parallelized code. That's what makes debugging hard. But the thing you can do is you can modelize it. You can say, well, I'm aware now that it's a lazy evaluation, which means, just like in a multi-thread code, but not exactly so, but if I put a breakpoint in the E is prime, even if I put a breakpoint there, well, it may not even hit that until I go past the sum. But once we change our minds towards it, then we start anticipating what this means, right? Uh, my point is sometimes watch will not work on this one for execution. Yeah. Uh, it will not give the result. That's, it's a lazy evaluation. Yeah, but you know exactly when it's going to call, now that you understand that. Yeah, well, exactly when it's going to call uh, some point of time, let's say, uh, this is a sim uh, simple uh, scenario. Then make any of this scenario complex, keep it simple still, right? So the point is, once you know how things behave, right, we got to keep one thing in mind. They pay you big bucks because you can do stuff. If you say you can't, guess what's going to happen? They'll find somebody else to do it, right? So that's why it's important to understand, right? We master things not because we fear them. We master things because we master them, right? We understand how they work. And then we're able to master it. So that is basically an example. Well, so what can we do? Well, sure, we can go do this, but we can also try something else. We can also try something else. What can we do? Well, rather than doing it this way, how about making it parallel, right? So we could say, do a parallel evaluation. Now what's going to happen? Well, if this is a large collection, and if I put a timer around it, you can start seeing the difference. Notice that the code structure is exactly the same. Whereas if I come and tell you to parallelize the code in the top, what would you do? That's not called parallelization, that's called parallelizing, right? It's like, welcome here, let's go, I want to run. So what to do, whereas this is trivial, isn't it? Because the structure flows really nicely, so you can start parallelizing the code much more easily. And there are several other constructs to do this. So that is an example of how you can go to a functional style. Well, earlier I think in the last session when I was asking, hey, I'm dealing with numbers, but can I deal with other things? Well, one of the things we normally do is violation of this principle called the tell and ask principle. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to show me the time. So the tell and don't ask principle basically says, you are telling the code what to do is a good principle. Instead, normally, what do we do? We go to the object and say, hey, give me some information. I'm going to do some work with it, and then I'm going to come back and tell you, change your state based on it. Which means you move the decision from the object or to an external entity. And that's a very common anti-pattern. So what we want to do is to move towards really a pattern where we tell rather than asking. Let's look at one example of this, just to get a feel. So in this example, what I'm going to do, I've got a bunch of classes here to work with and see how this is going to work. So what I have here in this case is a piece of code where I have a class called room. Well, room has a booked field, a Boolean field, a constructor that says if it's booked or not in the beginning, and is available simply is going to give me a uh, is available, whether it's booked or not. I'm going to have a book uh, method, which is going to take a day and time. And of course, after some logic, it says booked equals true. Now, I want to have a list of rooms here. So notice two rooms are booked, two rooms are not booked. So it's a list of books, uh, uh, rooms. So what am I saying? Room book the room equals null. How does it feel? No. That's a smell, right? So we start with the null. Then for each room in rooms, if a room is available, then book the room, then set the room to be booked, uh, the, the variable, and then break out of it. And then eventually book the room and we print it out. So you can see the imperative nature of this again. Let's try how we could do this a little differently. Well, I do want to check if it is available, and then if it is available, I want a book, but not otherwise. So could we rewrite this in a more of a functional style? Well, one disadvantage here is mutability is happening. 
If you really don't want immutability, you could say, well, take a collection and try another collection. But I'm not going to do that in this particular example. So what I'm going to do here is to start with the rooms available. So let's try this out. So let's comment this out for a minute. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here is a rooms. So I'm going to start with the rooms. So I'm going to say rooms dot. And what am I trying to do? I'm going to say where a room, given a room, I want to say room is available. And for the uh, date time now, right? So we did our where class. Well, if it is available, what should I do? Select. And I could say, well, given this room, I want you to say room.book for that time, right? And we can refactor that into a common variable if you want to. But what does book really return? The book returns a void. We could potentially do a little bit more work here. Why don't we do this instead? We could say public boolean book if available, instead of changing that existing method. And we'll say date time date. And here we would say if, so we could say if is available for date, then we could say something like a book for the date and return true. So we can say return true. So return true. Uh, otherwise, what do we do? So true. And otherwise else, let's say uh, return false. Well, we can simplify this a little bit, right? So book if available. So we can then say where room, and we can say room dot book if available for that date. Then we can get rid of this part. And then what should we do? Dot first. Again, we can get the first one available, right? So let's try see what, what it does. So I'm asking it to go through that and get me the very first one that's available. So checking, 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 and then it gave me a room. It did check me three times, not four times. Why? That's because of lazy evaluation. But once we understand lazy evaluation and the functional style here, we are able to run through and quickly say, hey, get me the first one that's available. Would you rather write the code in the top or the code in the bottom? The top one, of course. If you're a consultant getting paid by the number of lines of code you write, right? Bottom one if you want to get the work done, right? So another quick example here. I want to design with a higher order function. Let's take one example. You can minimize so much of code that you normally write if you uh, go this route also. Again, it's a change in mindset, but a huge benefit once we change our mindset. Let's look at this code, understand the code first of all. I've got something called an algorithm. What does this algorithm have? It says interface. The interface algorithm calculate, takes a double value and returns a double value, right? So algorithm is just an interface. Then I have a fast algorithm, whatever that means. It's got to calculate which returns some value after doing it really fast. Then I have a more accurate algorithm. So this is not going to be fast, but it's going to be more accurate, right? And what does it do? Again, it returns the input, just telling you that it's running that. But we've got another class now, right? So two classes in one interface. And then what do we have? I've got a property comp a computer. It's got an algorithm to compute that property. And you get the algorithm as a parameter to the constructor. And then what it's doing? It's setting the value into algorithm. And then when you call compute, it's calling the algorithms calculate method, getting the result. And it calibrates whatever it can do, returns the result eventually. And so here is the code. It uses the fast algorithm once and a more accurate algorithm the second time. So it produces some output. But uh, that's a lot of code to write. Does anybody see what design pattern was used here? That's right, it's a strategy pattern. But any suggestion what we can do to reduce the code? How could we refactor this? Do some work from outside. Do some work from outside. Give me a little thing I can change code. That's too broad. I have to call a consultant to fix that. Just tell me what I can do to change the code. Unbuild solution. What is it? No factory. 
Can you have a base class which, which is like you do some dependency injection? Dependency injection. Too much complicated. I want to reduce code, not increase code. What does this interface do? It's an algorithm. Does this interface look like anything else in C sharp? What was it? Abstract. Abstract. It's a funk. It's a funk, isn't it? So why should we create our own funk when there is a funk? Right? So there are two classes, right? Funk and action. What, are, what does action do? Action is a, something that has a side effect. Funk gives you, takes an input, gives you an output. So the very first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of this algorithm. Poof, gone. I could change this to public class algorithms and I'm going to convert the classes into methods. So I'm going to convert this to a static, I'll call it as a fast alg algorithm, right? Similarly, the second one, and I will convert that into static, and I will call this as, uh, what did I call it? What do I call it? I can't remember now. More, more what? Okay, accurate, right? So we'll call it accurate algorithm. So now that I have two things, right? A fast algorithm and I have an accurate algorithm. So these two are just functions in this case. If it even makes sense to be static, otherwise there can be instance methods. So those are the parts of algorithms. Now I come back to the property and I say, hey property, you get a func which takes a double and returns a double, right? So what does a constructor do? It takes a func which takes a double and returns a double. Well, then what does the compute do? The compute simply says, I'm going to just call the algorithm. Well, then what do we do here in the main? Well, all I'm going to do is simply change this to algorithms dot fast algorithm and change this one to algorithms dot um, accurate algorithms, right? So that's all I'm doing, changing those, and the result is exactly the same. So we can reduce quite a bit by thinking along the lines of funk and action. I feel a lot of us really underutilize these two guys. When you think about how you can use functions, design with your own funk, design with your own action, then you start changing your mind from, hey, I have to go build stuff, then hey, I can start using some of these stuff already in there, right? So you can reduce the amount of code we had. For the strategy, you don't need to put that much effort, right? Creating interfaces and classes. You can just start writing methods and pull them through with such a low ceremony, right? Look at how sweet this code is on this line. That's pretty compelling, isn't it? Not a whole lot of effort to write that code, and that is pretty awesome in terms of how we can write that code. That becomes very, very easy to work with. So when you're writing code, for example, let's say you're interested in measuring the time of a certain task. If you're trying to measure the time of a certain task, well, how would you normally measure the time of a certain task? You would say stopwatch, and then you your work in it, and then what do you do at the end? You say elapsed, right? Well, what do we do? Copy it. But it's the same operation you perform over and over and over. So how about doing something like this? You start thinking along the lines of, hey, I can start using some more functional style. So I'm going to say class time code. So the time code says, define a measure. Well, what am I interested in measuring? An action, and I'll call block. Now I'm interested in measuring the time for an action. So what would I do here? Well, stopwatch, and I would say stopwatch. So stopwatch, so that's a lowercase w. So stopwatch equals stopwatch dot uh, start new. Then you would say a uh, block and execute the block. Then you say stopwatch dot elapsed. 
So, so you can say elapsed time, and maybe time in milliseconds, right? So once you get the values for it, well, this would be your elapsed time. So it's a, it's a double, yeah, double uh, uh, time taken equals, right? So double time taken, so you'd say double and uh, time taken. So this is going to be time taken equals. Now, a little bit bonus for you. Hey, there could be an exception along the way. Hey, that's easy to handle now. Because even if there was an exception, I still want to measure the time. Well, that's easy. Try and finally around it. So you remove the duplication of that effort, and life becomes a lot easier, right? So then you say try, and you could say, for example, in this case, and you could say uh, finally, and then within the finally block, you could measure the time, and then once you measure it, you can return the time it took. So this would be what, uh, uh, instead of void, you could say public uh, double. And that could be the returned value, so you could simply say return. So that's returning the time this particular piece of code took, and called measure. You say, wait a minute, but I really don't want to do an action. I do want to get the result of this action as well. Well, then change the double to tuple, right? Well, the tuple could be a value for the computation and the result, whatever that result is. And then rather than taking an action, take a func. And then you can do your work within the function. How would you exercise this particular code? Well, you would exercise the code by saying, for example, uh, time, uh, time code dot measure, and then you would specify whatever code you want to specify. It could be a simple function you want to call, or it could be a lambda, right, depending on what you're going to do. If it's a sim simple function, simply put the name of the function, and then you're measuring the time for that function to be called, right? Then you can make it very much reusable. So if you are trying to measure performance between different algorithms, it becomes extremely trivial rather than duplicating the code. That's a great place where you can start leveraging some of these uh, concepts, right? So, anything, so, so I'm going to make a very um, arbitrary claim here. And the claim is, Anywhere you overused inheritance, you probably can eliminate that and use a func or a action. So if your only way to reuse code was using inheritance, you probably can get away by using a func or a action and, and do a better job. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, how can I extend that? I mean, if you, if you are going to replace your interfaces with func and Right. How extensibility work? Uh, the extensibility through uh, interface, there's a very default interface, right? So when you had an algorithm, what are you extending from there? Absolutely nothing. Because interface doesn't have any implementation. So all that the interface was doing was giving you a signature, that's it. A font gives you the same signature the interface did. So that was an unnecessary uh, complexity of uh, ceremony, right? If you had an abstract base class, well, yeah, then we're talking about something different. But we have much more extensibility here because you are telling, I don't care who you are, I don't care what your name is, all I care about is your signature. As long as you receive this kind of data and return that kind of data, I'm happy to work with you, right? That is really based on the capability rather than a contract, right? So your code is more extensible now because you can go to an arbitrary, cla arbitrary class and say, hey, you take a double and you're returning a double. As an example, I'm willing to work with you. Right. I don't care if you inherit interface. Yeah. It depends on the requirement which you have. It, everything does. Yeah. Uh, that's not, uh, assume it doesn't. We don't go to work and write output record and say, had a wonderful day at work. <laughs> it always does. So, so the point is that given that it actually gives us, interfaces didn't add any value, period, in this case. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. One more question. Yeah, please. Uh, like in your example, like you had a single method interface. The interface had only a single method. That's correct. But what if I had like multiple methods? Then you probably won't be able to change that. Before. That's correct. So anyway, we have single abstract method interface, we can use this. Yeah, only on that. Sorry? Yeah, only on that field. Right? Well, I would say that's a great start. Okay. How many times have we not doing that? 
Oh, yeah. But don't try to boil the ocean. Let's attack the problems and, and improve on it. You'll be surprised how much you're able to take this when you. And then you start asking, why did I put multiple methods in that interface in the first place? Okay. Am I better off actually designing this way? And suddenly you have a very different design on your hand moving this way. Because you begin to see that you're really becoming lightweight. And your code is not bulky, bloated, and so much to work with. And then testability becomes a lot easier because I can just send a lambda as a mock rather than sitting and creating a huge amount of mock. So it begins to change the way you view the world. It's, it's one of the funny things about this is, from here, not the beautiful, you might want to take seven steps further. But when you make the first change, you are in a place where you could never imagine before, and then it takes you to the next level of refactoring that you never ever thought of. And, and so when I sit down to start writing code, the code I would end up with in a day, I would look at this and say, there is absolutely no way I could have thought of this code from where I was a day ago, right? And, and the reason is, a bunch of refactoring opened a door for me that I never knew exist, and now I'm able to apply a refactoring technique, but if I had started over there, I, I'm not smart enough to think all the way here, right? So that's the beauty is, every little thing you chip away, it opens up another door for you, which is extremely powerful, right? That, that's the beauty of this. But if it shouldn't be in uh, production, don't even release the library. You don't even release the code. Don't why go through that much extent. If it's not in your build, it's not going to production. Right? Simple solutions. Why then come up with another tool to fix a problem that doesn't even exist? Just don't include it in the build. Right? I mean, and you're assuming you're using automated builds, right? Which are driven by command line rather than IDE generated, then it's very easy to say, hey, just don't include these guys. So that becomes a lot more easier. So to summarize what we did, we can move towards a lightweight design rather than a heavyweight design, and as a result, it really starts minimizing the amount of code to write. It also moves in the direction that we have been pretty lacking, and we can do a lot better. So slowly start refactoring. Every, every corner you turn, look for refactoring uh, options and see what you can do. That's all I have. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.